thanks so welcome all for celebrating uh, uh, the 2022 nobel award uh, this is a very 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 important for uh, at least the people who works in this field i just take one or two minutes even before just before introducing uh, manik because in some sense we both started our phd career in the same field together and we shared our postdoc uh, together and uh, wrote a paper together also worked to discuss it together but when we both started even monique also shared the same thought the quantum foundation people used to tell that this is the field for uh, retired people to work and we we would like to challenge those things at that uh, things but when 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 the when some appreciation like nobel award or other things comes to the field which really makes important so that's and some fundamental work is recognized by uh, some of the you know, well-known awards uh, it's it, it's an important for everyone not just from our field with this brief thing um, i would uh, be very happy to introduce uh, uh, dr manik uh, who is uh, an associate professor at a uh, center of science center for basic sciences is an associate professor there and uh, before joining SN Bose center for the uh, uh, basic sciences he was an assistant professor at uh, uh, icer uh, trivendram and uh, dst inspired faculty at SN Bose national center for uh, sciences and he had a postdoc at from uh, math science and phd from isi kolkata so manik uh, welcome to your talk please please take it. yeah Thanks, Arvinda. Let me share my slide first. Can you see my slide? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so make it enlarge. Okay. So okay. as uh, good afternoon, everybody. As Arvinda was telling, so when uh, when this prize is announced, I was actually recalling my days during my PhD days and post postdoc days when we used to discuss myself and Aurobindo and many other colleagues on this foundational topic. Actually, this award is very close to our heart because both of our PhD topic is exactly on Bell non local or PhD. After that, I little bit move on more on quantum information theory. But uh, today my aim is to establish, at least give a hint or, or, or a picture that Bell's theorem it is nothing about only foundation of quantum mechanics, rather it is foundation of physics. It's a very, very basic worldview it trying to teach us. That's why one, uh, one philosopher, uh, Henry Stapp, is an American mathemat uh, mathematician. He says Bell's theorem, the most profound discovery of science. That is very important. He says most profound discovery of science, not only physics. Uh, okay, there may be some uh, debate whether it is the most profound discovery in the last century. But it is one of the most profound discovery in the last century. So as we all know, uh, this year Nobel Prize is uh, given to uh, these uh, three very well-known scientists, Professor Alan Espex, John Closure, and Anton Jailinger. And the no Nobel Committee, it's mentioned that for experiment with entangled photons, established in the violation of Bell inequalities and pioneering quantum information science. For this reason, these three people, the three professors are given Nobel Prize. So in my talk, I will mainly focus why establishing violation of Bell inequality is so important. And first of all, what does Bell inequality try to tell us? So I'll take a, I start my talk by two quotations. So one by, this philosopher Karl Marx, who says, we know only one single science, that is the science of history. Another is by Imre Lakatos, who says, history of science without philosophy of science is blind, and philosophy of science without history of science is empty. So my motive is try to discuss what philosophical challenges try to Bell's theorem, try to address, and I will take a historical perspective. That historically, what question motivates this kind of this kind of uh, uh, research? John Bell initiated, and finally, experiment is done by lots of people, and particularly pioneered by three people who got this Nobel Prize. 
So any scientific research program, generally the methodology is these three fundamental steps. This is called thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. What is thesis? You can try to think it as, okay, we observe something and we take some hypothesis or some axiom. Let's say we throw a ball outside, um, ball upward, and we see that it fell down. So we take a hypothesis that if anything we throw up upward, it will fall down. This is our thesis. Now next step is antithesis. Okay, for ball it is true. Is it true for a other object also? We try to do it. We try to disprove our hypothesis by doing many experiments. Many, many experiments, we are trying to disprove it. This is called antithesis. Try to contradict or negate the hypothesis. So if a thesis persists under many such antithesis, then we call, OK, it might be the law of the nature. So resolve, resolve the conflict between thesis and antithesis, and we formulate the law of the nature. But we should remember that no matter how impressive or obvious a loss looks. If new experiment comes, it might happen that new phenomena cannot be explained within this old law. And being a scientist, we have to keep our mind open to accept it and to, to, to look into a more deeper understanding about the nature. So keeping this back, backdrop in mind, let's try to understand a very simple concept. And we'll see okay, what worldview we want to see, an old but profound world. To understand that, let's try to design a very simple minded experiment. The experiment is there is a closed opaque box, and in this opaque box, some object is there. Okay, good. And about this object, we are interested to know its property. But which property? Let's say two properties we are interested to know. First property is we are interested to know its shape. And let's say it is promised that shape is either circular or triangular, but it is not told to us, it is kept, we have to know the shape. And second property is its color. So color could be either red, it is promised that either it is red or it is blue. So that means there are four options. It could be a circular red object, it could be a circular blue object, it could be a triangular red object, it could be a triangular blue object. Now, let's try to define a measurement or a procedure, we call it shape measurement. What does we mean by shape measurement? We want to design an experiment that will give us the knowledge of shape only, but no knowledge about the color. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. Very simple. We go to in a dark room or we put into our hand inside this box, we touch the object, we understand oh, whether it is circular or triangular, but it doesn't give us knowledge about the color. This procedure, what I say, this is, a, this is a simple experiment. Let's denote it by this experiment, this square shape box, gray color box. So it has some input and it is possible to output either red, circular or triangular, and finally it will be out. What does it mean? So when we take the object, we do the shape measurement, we obtain this, okay, shape shape is circular, then we understand, okay, my shape of the object is actually circular. That is a very simple-minded experiment. What about color measurement? Again, we can consider a measurement that will only give us knowledge about the color, but no knowledge about shape. Is it possible? Yes, it is of course possible. We can make a very small pinhole dot in on the, on the box and look through it. Since we will only see the part of the object, it will give us knowledge about the color, but full shape we will not know. Okay, let's say for the time being, we, we, we uh, conceptualize that it is possible in, in principle to do it. So this is we call color measurement. And color measurement, I will denote by like this green color box. Again, it has one input and possible to outcome red color or blue color. And when object is measured, color measurement, it gives one of the color, either red or blue. And if I get blue color, then I update my state, okay, it was actually blue. Okay, with this, let us go a little bit step further. Sequential measurement, what does that mean? Okay, I take this object, I first perform the shape measurement, and I obtain the shape is circular. 
okay then my uh, my uh, uh, object will be uh, updated as a page is a circular object then i perform on the same box i am not changing the box on the same box i am now performing the color measurement and let's say i obtain this color is blue fine then let's go in further step let's again try to perform the shape measurement what we will see is a classical one. just it just our daily life very simple observation i first perform shape measurement i find it is circular and then i see color measurement i see it is blue and on the same object i again try to know the shape measurement what i will see if we ask this question to anyone simple answer again i will see shape is circular and we are doing this experiment many many times from this experiment, what conclusion we can make? We can make a very generic conclusion, very, very simple, but very profound conclusion. Conclusion is that knowledge of color, that means one property, does not destroy the knowledge of shape, a different property. That is a very fundamental conclusion we take. Not only that, we can actually go further. We can say, okay, that means since after this color measurement, I was, it is still shape is circular. And this, when I am performing the shape measurement, I am getting the shape value circular. That means my measurement doesn't create the value. It just reveals the value. The object was initially red as well as blue. The object is initially circular as well as blue. My measurement only just reveals this value. So this worldview, it is very fundamental worldview we take in our everyday life. This is called reality. That means property is already possessed by the system. Our measurement, our interaction with the system just reveal this value. This value we, we call it is reality. So there is, this is not true for color and shape. It is any two property, any two, three, four, any number of property we can consider, imagine that is true. And doing this observation many, many, many times, we take this worldview that, okay, reality exists. And that is very common sense. Why it is correct? Yes. When we measure some mass, measure some temperature, height, length, it is already there. I am just revealing this is help. Okay. So it was this concept was not very new. It was known for last few thousand years for it's from during Greek time or more ancient time people know this concept of reality but probably it's more formalized uh, practically in theory it is formalized in Newton theory that position momentum these are property of the system and we try to describe this system with some equation like that but in 19th and early 20th century 1921 there was some experiment with mic microscopic level. What is this experiment? This is called uh, Stern Galak experiment. So, this experiment is also a very simple experiment. There is some oven, heated oven. It emits some microscopic particle, and this part particle passes through some magnetic field and inhomogeneous magnetic field. And since this magnetic field, it is a magnetic field vector field, we have to say with which direction magnetic field is aligned. In this case, in this picture, magnetic field is aligned along z direction and it is observed that okay either the particle deflect upward direction or downward direction oh, that is also a little bit peculiarity uh, it should be some continuum but here we are getting some discrete outcome we are not going to mathematical details of these things but we are saying this is also we are trying to know some property of the system what are the property we want to know how the system behave, it is passed through an inhomogeneous magnetic field aligned along sigma z direction. Again, possible to outcome measurement, outcome are possible, upward deflection or downward deflection. From now onwards, I will pictorially denote this measurement in a simple manner, that this is my oven, then I perform a sigma z measurement, that means I pass through the particle along inhomogeneous magnetic field aligned along z direction and possible outcome are plus zero and minus. Good. Okay, let's see, we can compare this. This, this is a little bit sophisticated experiment, but whether we can compare this, 
with our basic experiment of color shape analogy. So this triangular setup, we, we have this oven, and with this perform sigma z measurement, there are two possible outcomes are there. Okay, I can consider, okay, this is actually a shape kind of measurement. Their shape was possible two outcome, circular or triangular. And if we measure one of the outcome will occur. Okay, then let's do this measurement. First, I do Z measurement. There are two possible outcomes, sigma Z, up and down. Let's we don't consider down particle, downward deflected particle. Upward deflected particle can again pass it through sigma Z in homogeneous magnetic field, Z direction. It's again performing sigma Z spin measurement. Again, we are observing that always it is only half outcome is coming. No down outcome is coming. Okay, that is not astonishing. We can again go to there. Okay, if we observe some object, I observe first measure its shape. I obtain it is circular. Then again, I may try to measure its shape. Of course, I will get its shape circular only. That is fine. Let's go one step further. Let's say we perform sigma z measurement and take the up, upward deflected particle and then pass the particle through inhomogeneous magnetic field but this time the magnetic field is aligned along x direction but we are seeing here okay again both outcome are possible up and up and down both outcome are possible is it surprising we can ask this question again this is not so surprising we can think it in shape color analogy Oh, the sigma z is like shape. We obtain the shape circular. And then if I ask the color, what is this color? If color can be again possible to value. Either red or blue. Good. So probably it is something like that it is happening. Now let's go one step further. What we do? Let's come here. We first perform shape measurement. We obtain circular outcome. Then we perform color measurement, we obtain blue color, and then I again perform shape measurement. What do we observe? Even earlier, we have already seen that it, the outcome is circular only. But this time, in this experiment, Stangalak experiment, it is coming that again, this my Z outcome can be both up and down if possible. Then how to explain this phenomenon? This is very peculiar. Because now, as if my Z measure, X measurement is disturbing the outcome of my Z measurement. So apparently, we take a world view, no? That measurement does not create the value of the property, rather it reveals the value of the property. How to now accommodate this world view in this experiment? That is the question, or that is the challenge. So that, what about real? So, and this kind of experimental laser actually observed in Sterngalak setup. So now that brings the fundamental debate between two forefathers of quantum mechanics. One is Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr. What they are trying to say that our standard quantum description, this gives probabilistic outcome, but that probability is fundamentally different than what probability we appear in our classical world? Classical world probability appears due to our ignorance. But this probability is fundamentally probabilistic in nature. It is not classical ignorance. It is objective probability. That's why this kind of probably we all of our of this kind of uh, statement. Einstein doesn't used to think that, okay, nature should be fundamentally probabilistic in nature. That's why he said, I at any rate am convinced that he God does not throw dice. Of course, here by God, he means nature. It means fundamentally, nature description is not random. He doesn't want to believe that. On the other hand, Niels Bohr is trying to say, okay, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. It means, okay, what, how nature is, we have to accept it. Why you are imposing condition on nature? So that is the debate. Now, what stand we have to take? So it, it raises some very fundamental question on quantum foundation or foundational status of quantum description. So, okay, I'm not going to too much details here, but actually in this, if you ask, we ask this question, actually in some sense, we can have a deterministic explanation what Einstein wanted. 
it is possible for simple quantum system. If my quantum system is actually a two-level quantum system, such a description is actually possible. Uh, that is a little bit technical, but I am not going in detail. That, that is first given by John Bell in 1964, and then also by Kotelsbecker in 1966. But let's move on. Let's move on to another, another world. So first world view is reality. In some sense, it is challenged. Apparently, it is challenged by quantum experiment. Let's talk about another world. This is comparatively or relatively new. What is say? So let's say Alice and Bob are two parts, and they are separated. How far? How, uh, how far they are? You can imagine whatever you want. One is here. Bob is, Alice is here. Let's say at uh, Kolkata, and Bob is let's say at the extreme end of the universe. The separation doesn't uh, doesn't bother too much in our argument. Now again, Alice and Bob doing the same experiment of our color and shape measurement. So again, Alice has some box and Bob has some box. So Alice might want to know what, what is the shape of the object, or she might want to know what is the color of the, of the object. Similarly, Bob also might wish to know what is the shape of her this object, as well as he wants to know what is the color of his object. So let's Alice perform does shape measurement and he obtained outcome circular. Let's, Bob wants to know shape of his object and he also ob obtained circular. He could get triangular also. But let's consider next scenario. Bob wants to know shape, but uh, Alice wants to know shape, but Bob this time wants to know color of his object. Now the question is, we can ask this question. What Alice will observe at his object, property of, of the object she is possessing, does it, does, it, does it change what Bob is observing? Because Bob is far apart, no. So Alice observing shape and she, she is getting circular. Does it change whether Bob observes circular or so Bob observes shape measurement or color measurement on his object? Because Bob is far apart. We take a stand. No, it should not change. So Bob observation outcome should not depend what observation, Alice observation outcome should not depend what Bob is doing on his object. Similarly, Bob's observation should not depend what Alice is doing on her object. This one view, it is called, actually, it's called locally. In other words, it is motivated by this famous relativistic causality principle that says no information or no influence should travel faster than light. Any information travel, there is a finite speed limit. So it prohibits this. Locality assumption is justified by relativistic causality principle that prohibits superluminal propagation of causal influence. Okay, so now we have two worldview, both are profound and fundamental, that is called reality, and locally, sometimes in quantum foundation, people call it together local realism. And sometimes people also call local causality. Bell probably like this local causality term more, more, uh, he likes this particular terminology local causality more. Uh, there may be a finer difference between this local realism and local causality, but in our talk today, we are not going to that detail. And actually, if somebody is more philosophical interested to this concept, one can go into this, this book. This is a very famous book in philosophy, Reichenberg Common Cause Principle, that any classical correlation can be always explained by this common cause. Uh, means it's a local causal explanation is always possible. Now in 1935, as I said, Einstein and Bohr had long debate regarding the status of quantum uh, foundational status of quantum mechanics. In 1935, Einstein really come up with a breakthrough. And this is the, one of the means headline at that time in New York Times, Einstein attacks quantum theory. Scientists and two colleagues find it is not complete, even though correct. Let's try to understand what they are trying to say or how they are trying to challenge quantum theory. <clears throat> Okay, uh, just a footnote, actually Einstein was probably not happy with this article published in this daily newspaper. 
uh, because his argument was the this kind of discussion it should be more it should only go to common people once it is properly formulated okay so this is the famous paper can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete so their title start with a question mark so immediately it raises a debate among the scientists or forefather working on quantum or developing quantum mechanics at that time among lots of people write paper at that time right uh, Bohr, Schrodinger, everyone so Bohr, this is the Bohr paper title, exactly same title, Can Quantum Mechanical Description of Physical Reality Be Considered Complete in same, uh, same volume, maybe on next volume, so 1935. So we'll discuss, we'll discuss what is EPR, how Einstein models here and Rosen challenge quantum mechanics. But before that, let us just briefly try to recollect what quantum mechanics tells us. So, or sometimes it is called Copenhagen interpretation because that in Copenhagen Solve conference they formulated it properly. So, first postulate says a system is completely described by a wave function, which is mathematically can be seen as a vector in Hilbert space, some Hilbert space. Hilbert space is some vector space, inner product space, complete, some mathematical property it has. So, a system is completely described by wave function. Like in classical mechanics, a system, a particle is completely described by its position and momentum, but here in quantum world, the system is completely described by a wave function, which is nothing but a vector in Hilbert space. The probability that a measurement of a quantum system will, will yield a given result is governed by bond. So if we want to know something that is described by some Hermitian operator acting on the Hilbert space, if we perform the measurement, which outcome will come, we cannot tell. If we do this experiment long term, then we can say what, what is the frequency of obtaining a particular outcome and this probability or frequency given by this famous bond rule. It's a mathematical, mathematically defined, but for our today's discussion, the explicit mathematical formalism is not required. In the act of measurement, the wave function of the system can change suddenly and discontinuously. If we do the measurement, you ob obtain some outcome, then initial wave function all of a sudden change to a new wave function. And this process is not continuous. If no measurement is performed, wave function evolution is given by a unitary or Schrodinger dynamics, which is a continuous evolution. But measurement make a discrete jump, discontinuous evolution. It is sometimes also called collapse. And another final thing is that if we have more than two particle system, the composite system is described by Tensor product Hilbert space of the component subsystem. Okay, now what if we are trying to pose the question? Okay, we are trying to say, okay, their challenge is not whether quantum mechanics is correct or not. They are trying to say whether quantum mechanics is cons complete or not. So, can look into their title, can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete? Now, they say, okay, what is meant by complete? Now let's look into their paper. Whatever the meaning assigned to the term complete, the following requirement for a complete theory seems to be necessary one. That every element of physical reality must have a counterpart in the physical theory. In, 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 in simple term, what is it, it tells? That if there is some physical reality, my theory should capable of describe this physical reality. But okay, saying this, naturally the question appears, what do you mean by physical reality? What they say? Okay, they say if you see it is very naturally means common sense criteria they take. They say if without in any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty, that means with probability equal to unity, the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. That means in our shape color measurement, you see our measurement is just revealing the value. It is not disturbing anyway. It is just revealing the value. So the shape is system's reality. Color is system's reality. So if something is there like that, then it must be the system physical reality. Now with this, this definition of reality, how they proceed? They consider a bipartite system. There is a source which produces two particles. One is 
thrown towards the least, another is thrown towards Bob, who are far separated. And these two particles is actually prepared in peculiar state. This is a composite system, bipartite composite system. This zero, one are nothing but you can imagine is the eigenstate of sigma z measurement. And this state is called singlet measurement. Now you, you, you carefully look, Alice and Bob are far separated. Now what Alice does, she performs, she wants to know what is the sigma z, spin sigma z value on her system. So Alice performs a spin measurement along z direction. Now let's say she obtain outcome zero. Immediately she knows, okay, if Bob performs sigma z measurement, Bob's outcome will be one. So if her measurement is zero, she, certain, she is certain that Bob's outcome will be one. On the other hand, if her outcome is one, she is certain that Bob's outcome is zero. This is coming from this peculiar state. This is called entangled state, single, single state. Of course, though, although Einstein and Podol's Einstein, if we are in their paper, they don't use the term entanglement, and also they don't consider spin system, they consider position momentum system. This simple version was later uh, provided by David Bohm, and the term entanglement was introduced by Schrodinger. Okay, now we can what we can see from say from here that without disturbing both system, at least any disturbance that requires some time to propagate. Hello? Yeah. Hello, am I audible? Oh, yes, Hello. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So that, so therefore we can say thus, without disturbing Bob's system, at least can predict the value of Z measurement. And since Bob is far apart, it requires some time. So this sigma Z must have a physical reality. So Einstein and EPR say, okay, then without disturbing the system, I can predict this property, it must have a physical property. Up to that, there is no problem. If you, if you prepare the system in a sigma z eigenstate, then you can actually predict its value deterministically without disturbing its system. No contradiction, no problem with quantum mechanics. But this state has a little bit peculiar. You can actually write the same state in sigma x eigenstate also. So, so in earlier slide, what argument we put for Z measurement on Alice and Bob part, same is true if we consider X measurement, sigma X measurement. Then according to the criteria of physical reality, sigma X, sigma X is also has a physical reality. That is also true. But now requirement of completeness, completeness demand, both sigma X and sigma Z should have physical reality. But that Copenhagen, quantum mechanics says no, that is not possible because they are incompatible measurement, they are non-commutating measurement, they cannot have joint prepared in, there is no, no common eigenstate to that. So that's why quantum uh, Einstein and Podol's uh, ETR is trying to say, okay, quantum mechanics is gives us a correct description, but it does not give a, gives a complete description. So how they ends? While we have the shown that the wave function does not provide a complete description of the physical reality, we left open the question of whether or not such a description exists. And they believe, however, that such a theory is possible. So, okay, although the paper created at that time in 1913, uh, uh, 1935, a great debate among foundation, among the people working in foundation, but gradually, people try to, people start not bothering about this question because they try to think, okay, that is, because finally quantum mechanics is giving me a correct description. Why asking all this question? This is a kind of philosophical stand. What it will give? Uh, for nearly three decades, people, okay, some people give some try, but actual nearly three decades, there is not enormous study in this direction. And it comes after three decades when John Bell appear in this field. So John Bell actually by practice, he is a particle uh, accelerator designer. He used to work in first in Sun and then for a few years, he was a probably in Bell lab also. Then, and then again, he returned in Sun lab. And he has lots of fundamental contribution in particle accelerator designer. In his term, I am a quantum engineer, but on Sundays, I have principles. 
which on Sunday he used to think about this philosophical implication. So apparently it seems okay. There's some philosophical question. Why to bother about that? But somehow John will take this question that okay, let's try to resolve this status. What is happening? So now in the next few minutes, our aim will be to understand what Bell in 1964 paper he's trying to establish. He's trying to look into this Einstein question. Can we have a local realistic description that will underlie underlying local realistic description for quantum mechanics? That was his question. Let's try to understand Bell's theorem, but we will again start with a very simple game. Again, this is a very simple game. This is the game scenario. There is a one referee, let's call him Charlie. And again, two separate parties, Alice and Bob. And Charlie asks, in every run of this game, each run of this game, Charlie asks one of two possible questions to Alice. And these are some logical questions. That's why for simplicity, we denote question zero or question one. And these are since logical question, Answer is also we are for every each question, Alice has to give plus one or minus one answer. Similarly, Charlie asked two questions, let's denote it by y, which can take two values zero and one to Bob. And similarly, Bob has to answer plus one or minus one. Importantly, once the game starts, before the game, before the game starts, Alice and Bob can talk to with each other. But once the game starts, they are separated and they are not allowed to communicate with each other. So this is our game scenario. Now let's look into one particular game. So whenever we say game, we have to decide some set means condition, winning condition that, okay, this is the scenario. Now say what will happen then uh, we'll say Alice and Bob winning the game or not. So this is a very boring game. What is this game? It says, okay. Whatever question is asked to Alice and whatever question is Bob to uh, ask, uh, ask to Bob, they have to give some answer and product of their answer should be always plus one. So we can denote it like that. That means A of X, A of X means what? Alice's answer when Alice is asked question X and B of Y is Bob's answer when Bob is asked Y question, that product should always be plus one for all X, Y, whatever question is asked to, Alice and Bob. So now we can ask this question without communicating. And, and this winning condition is tell Alice and Bob earlier before starting the game and they can talk to it with each other before the game starts. But once the game starts, they cannot talk with each other. And we can ask this question, can Alice and Bob win this game? They have to satisfy this first condition, winning condition. See, if we just think a little bit, answer is yes, it is possible. How? They decide, okay, we have to always give plus one answer. Our product should be plus one answer. Let's, whatever question come, Alice will always give answer plus, and Bob always give answer plus, their product will always be plus. So yes, it is possible to win this game. And you can see that this is not only the strategy, they can fix another strategy also before starting the game. But whatever question is asked to me, Alice, Alice will always give answer minus one. Bob will also always give minus one their product will be plus one. That is also a winning, another winning strategy. Okay, so this is a very boring game, this it can be win. Let's make it, the game a little bit interesting. So this time winning conditions tell us the product of the Alice's outcome and Bob Alice's come should be plus one if they are given same question. And the, their product should be minus one if they are given different question. But you see, this time you have to remember, Alice doesn't know what question is given to Bob. She only knows what question is given to her. Similarly, Bob doesn't know what question is given to Alice. He only knows what question is given to him. So this time it seems a little bit tricky. And again, we can ask this question. Can you win this game? In this case also, it turns out, yes. They say, okay, we have to satisfy this, this, this condition. They decide, okay, if zero question is asked, both will always answer plus one. If one question is asked, they will give minus one. Now look into the table. If Alice is answered zero, she is giving plus one. 
if bob is answer uh, question ask question y he is also giving plus 1 their product is plus 1 if both are giving y their answer is minus again product is plus 1 and if their question is different their outcome is different therefore product is minus 1 so this game can also be though it is apparently seems little bit interesting game but it can be actually win perfectly okay now let's make the game little bit more interesting what is the winning condition now this winning condition tells product of their outcome that should be minus 1 to the power x y can we win this game so let's answer is no we cannot win this game let us try to analyze okay, what this winning condition tells us that a0 times b0 that should be plus 1 a0 plus b1 that should be plus 1 a1 times b0 that should be also plus 1 and a1 times b1 that should be minus 1 now the question is is it possible to satisfy all these four condition before the game they can come up with any strategy but you see we can give a one line proof it is not possible how you just product left hand side and right hand side on left hand side what you are getting in left hand side you are getting a0 square a1 square b0 square and b1 square and a0 b0 b1 a1 b1 both can take only plus minus value so their square is always plus one but on the left hand right hand side we are getting minus one so it's immediate contradiction so it cannot win perfectly okay so then what question next question we can ask what is the maximum success probability winning this game they cannot perfectly win this game what is the maximum success probability winning this game? They can decide, come up with a strategy. Okay, whatever question we, is asked, always we will answer plus one. And in this case, out of four, in three cases, they are successful. So their success probability is 75. Now, what Bell proves? Bell proves the proof I am not going. This is also very simple proof. Bell is well proved in his theorem that any theory any theory which has a local realistic means if we take a local realistic world view then success probability of this game is always upper bounded by 75 percent you cannot win more than 75 percent the proof i am not discussing just you can uh, yourself try with that there are only 16 possible strategies that they are there in each case you will find it is not possible more than 75 percent and then take the convex mixture of that, then you can immediately argue it is not possible. And Bell in his work actually make it more, more formalized that, okay, how this locality assumption, reality assumption, or actually in Bell word, he doesn't use the term local realism, he used local causality using all this concept, this worldview, locality and reality. He actually gives a very simple analytic proof that success probability of this game cannot be more than 75%. Now, let's say, in some sense, in some exhumant, in Alice and Bob come up with a strategy that is showing more than 75% success. Then, what would be our conclusion? Our conclusion will be. Okay, our theory is not actually local causal. So our worldview that we are taking, this local realistic worldview, that is now in, in challenge. Success probability if it becomes more than 75%. And Bell also in his paper actually shown that quantum mechanics, if you use quantum mechanics, this entangled state, same entangled state used in the TPR paper. And if Alice performed suitable measurement on her part, depending on the question she is obtained. And similarly, Bob performs suitable measurement on his part of the system, entangled part, depending on the question he obtained from Charlie, the success probability can be actually 85%. It is more than 75%. That means quantum correlation cannot explain by a local causal worldview. So the law, the local realistic worldview, what we have take due to our from our observation, that is now in challenge. What Einstein and EPR, Einstein, Polonsky and Rosen are dreaming for, 
that they believe that such a description is possible, which is local realistic. Bell theorem proves that if you go, if you obtain a more than 75% success, then it is not possible. That means what Bell actually did in his work. So a nearly metaphysical question, which was an apparently philosophical debate regarding the foundational status of quantum theory. He, he brings the question to experimental level. He says, okay, we are physicists. Why we will take a position on Einstein on, or Bohr, who is correct? Rather, let's go to lab and try to do the experiment and see what nature is giving to us. Is it always bounded by 75% or we are getting success more than 75%? We'll decide okay, what worldview we'll take from experiment. So this is the backdrop of this uh, closure on this, on this aspect, closure and uh, Janninger experiment. They actually take this challenge that how to do this experiment. So these are the papers. Actually, I'm not going into the technical details of this experiment. These are extremely sophisticated experiments. And when initial experiment was, this was the initial experimental proposal by Michael Closure and this John Closure, Horne, Shimoni, and all. And then probably Closure also performed one experiment also. But, but this experiment, there was some loophole also. Then Alan Aspect come up with more sophisticated experiment. And actually, there is a beautiful story. When uh, probably in uh, 1970s or 71, Alan Aspects, when he joined in some, uh, in some uh, institute, he come up with this idea that he will perform this experiment. And at that time, he talked with one of his senior professor. He said, okay, you first go to meet John Bell. He was in turn, go to him, what he's saying, try to discuss with him. And Alan Aspect actually go to John Bell. He says, okay, Closure has already performed your, uh, the experiment of your paper, your proposal, but there is some loophole and I am trying to think, okay, he is trying to think how to overcome this loophole. And he discussed all this concept to John Bell, but then aspect is saying he gets surprised when John Bell, instead of motivating him, first say, he asked, do you have a permanent position? So this was the situation at that time. Because who will give you funding to perform this kind of experiment? Then Aspect says, yes, he has some position. And then actually they have a beautiful discussion. And uh, Alan Aspect re returned to his institute with the idea how to perform this experiment. And then it takes five to six years to design the experimental setup. And in 1981, 82, 83, three consecutive papers they have right. And then Jailinger and his collaborator make the more sophisticated experiment in more recent. And the, all this experiment actually shows that in the game, what we, are, we have discussed earlier, we are actually getting success probability more than 75%. Now, since in experiment, we get this success probability more than 75%, what is our conclusion? The conclusion is enormously profound. What we can say? Somebody can say, okay, quantum mechanics is non-local. Quantum mechanics cannot be explained by a local realistic quality. That is true. But even we can go further. We can say nature is non-local because it might happen that, okay, so in, in, in coming future, it might happen we have to replace quantum mechanics by some more sophisticated theory. But still, that theory must have, must be non-local because that is the experimental fact established by this aspect closure and Jailinger experiment. That's why this is fundamentally so important. Even from fundamental perspective, I think their work deserve, we think their work uh, deserve Nobel Prize. And we used to, when we used to do, 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 do this, this uh, PhD, People within our community, they believe due to only this foundational implication, this experiment is for the means deserved Nobel Prize. But now at present, the situation is more drastic. It is not only foundation, it is giving lots of practical implication. That's why in uh, Nobel Committee, it's mentioned that pioneering quantum information science. Lots of it is not about, about philosophy. It's giving you practical technology also. So application, application-wise now quantum 
non locality is deeply linked with communication complexity which is another hugely means broad research domain it is also related to quantum information theory quantum cryptography it gives device independent randomness generation which has experimentally been implemented device yes, independent sir. quantum key distribution or secure communication and other device independent protocol and i'll end my talk by few comments as i said alan aspect he sees bell's theorem as an ap view of experiments how to do experiment on the foundational status of our world that is how alan aspect speaks bell's theorem according to henry b step is the most profound discovery of science let's see what bell say regarding this bohr einstein debate bell says bohr was inconsistent unclear willfully obscure but it becomes bohr is right einstein was consistent clear down to earth and wrong so einstein what approach in epr paper einstein was taking that is the correct approach scientific approach but nature is not like that our world view say okay our world should be our, our world should be local realistic but experiment showing that no we have to keep our mind open we have to take this new world view nature is non local so i end my talk one of my favorite quote by uh, n david marmin who is his, who is one of the pioneering researcher who is still alive in this quantum foundation and he has lots of beautiful paper explaining bell's theorem what he says what makes the pursuit of science so engrossing is to learn that one's most strongly held beliefs can be completely wrong in this case in our today's talk this strongly hold belief of local reality that is wrong the search to identify and correct the old errors can lead to deep insight into nature foundationally as well as technologically the world would be a far better place for all of us if this joy scientists find in exposing their own misconception were more common in other areas of human endeavor so with this i'll thank you all for your patience and uh, i can take some question or comments or your discussion if you have if anyone thanks manik for a wonderful talk uh, so anyone if you have the question uh, so you can unmute yourself and then ask okay so first there yeah, are two people raised your hand manirul you can ask and then kunika okay th first first of all thanks manik for this beautiful talk uh, so uh, uh, my question is that if we allow non locality i mean if we appreciate uh, if we we are okay with non, non locality in a theory yes. then david bohm already have in, has in, uh, had invented his uh, causal uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics using this Uh, hidden variable theory yes so if, uh, if because i am asking this is yeah, from yeah, your yeah, comment uh, yeah, that a new question. theory you are you are expecting a new theory theory where non locality you are you are allowing then yeah so can you please yeah yeah uh, i probably got your question you see uh, i i make my uh, my uh, presentation brief but if we look into 1935 when einstein make this question so bell it's he starting this thinking about this question from 1940 45 onwards and he come up with the one work by john von neumann this is 1931 and people have already said john bell that okay von von neumann in his book already prove a theorem that such a local realistic model is hidden variable is not possible and john bell proved him wrong yeah right john von neumann uh, von neumann, von neumann. Uh, yeah von neumann told that Uh, told us that any that hidden variable theory hidden is, not variable possible, theory is not, possible. not possible but oh, bell so. showed that uh, yeah, uh, yeah there 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 was some mistake in von neumann's uh, analysis exactly Because so now i'm saying now bell is thinking okay von neumann already proved no hidden variable theory is possible 
Then he is saying, okay, let's try to understand von Neumann proof. He finds the misconception in his proof. And then in 1951, he says, okay, David Bohm already gave a model. Then what is happening? He finds that, okay, in Bell model, in this, von, uh, this David oh. Bohm model doesn't satisfy the locality condition one, what Einstein is dreaming about. It yeah. satisfies reality condition. It is a deterministic description, it's but it has a yeah. locality condition. Yeah. Einstein, in his paper, raised a question about local deterministic theory. Yeah. Then it, it actually, actually, von Neumann, uh, uh, sorry, David Bohm uh, gives a motivation to come up with this theorem. He is saying, okay, let's now try to derive a theorem that no local realism model is possible. If you try yeah. to build the theory, either you have to sacrifice locality or you, you have, have to give up one concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either, yeah. Uh, Does it answer yeah. your question? Yeah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Th uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, so next, Punika, uh, you have raised um, So, so uh, we have to give up either locality or reality. Yes. So, uh, just the way he said, uh, so is it proven that uh, we cannot give up on locality? Like no. there cannot be, no, no right? From so, Bell's uh, theorem? From Bell's theorem? From Bell's theorem, we can only tell local reality. This conjunction is not true. Now, now which one is which one is to sacrifice? No, Bell's theorem is silent about that. You need to come up with a new theorem for that. And of course, okay. some research is still going on in that direction, but that is more related with this uh, this measurement problem, interpretation, single wall interpretation. But Bell's theorem cannot answer this question. So can you go back to your... local realism is not possible, but which one? No, it cannot say that. Okay, so can you go back to the slide where you have uh, explained uh, entanglement and lo lo locality? Entanglement. So, yeah, yeah, I have a question there. This one? Uh, uh... Yes, a little before this, actually, where you have made that uh, space like separated diagram, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, here, here. So, uh, if we try to uh, give up on, let's say that we have reality and we try to give up on locality, would that uh, would that mean uh, not? Let's say let like, let's not even uh, violate locality. Let's say reality is there, but uh, does this mean? that a faster than uh, light influence would be possible? Now, now, now again, this is a good question. So violation of locality, does it imply immediate faster than light uh, communication is possible in operational world? No. Yeah, no it is not not possible. even signaling, but this is, there's some sort of influence you're saying. See, some sort of influence is there, light. but that you cannot use to send faster than light signal. That is the BOM model. BOM model locality is violated, but still in BOM model, you cannot, you cannot same faster than light information. Because now, in that case, now we have, we have to go a little bit more details. That, okay, what is ontology? What is operational theory? It, on tick level, it is a locality is violated. But in operational level, whenever we take the average, again, no signaling is satisfied. It is, again, compatible with this realistic causality principle. That's why here I mentioned locality is motivated from realistic causality. It is not exactly identical. We have to go further, 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 Details here. Yeah. Okay, Aditi, you have a question. Okay. Uh, Aditi, Aditi raised the hand, but uh, okay. So I have some question may I are in chat also. You can read the questions. Yeah. So Somia and chat, chat. Yeah. Chat. I, will. I will read if you, if you are not able to see. Yeah, hi, morning, sir. Hi, hi, please, please, yeah. Hi. So, uh, thank you for the very nice talk as usual. And so, my question is: so, uh, quantum mechanics has lots of interpretation. So, all the interpretation uh, for all the interpretation, Will's theorem is uh, correct, right? Uh, you see, Will's theorem doesn't talk about interpretation. Nothing. Will's theorem only says a local realistic worldview. That is not allowed. That is not possible. Now, the question of many world, single world, Bayesian, there are lots of different interpretations. Can we say something regarding that? 
these are the question these are the next level question observer regarding measurement problem and in recent time there are some some again i will say really some great discovery is happening and actually in 2015 there is 15 or 16 at that time or maybe more recent i forgot the year 2017 maybe 18 uh, this particularly Bruckner and then uh, then uh, Renato Renal group and finally most performed version is uh, Wiseman group they come up with a cement whose conclusion is more stronger than base and they are actually challenging single wall interpretation so they are actually challenging Bohmian interpretation but it is under debate at, at, at present still some some uh, some thesis or some Bohmian um, some thesis to believe in Bumian interpretation, they are trying to come up with new logic, how to save that, uh, save that uh, interpretation. But both on Bell's theorem only say local realistic worldview is not possible. Nothing more, nothing less. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Manik. Uh, Manik, there is a one question in the chat. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, as Bell's theorem is validated, established local reality does not exist. Did they observe 100% success quality? Yeah, that's as, as I was telling. So this experiment is extremely sophisticated experiment. There are lots of loopholes. So first of all is detection loophole. Another is the locality loophole. Another is freedom of choice loophole. So locality loophole, detection loophole means that, okay, this entangled photon they are sending. Now detector efficiency is not perfect. Then what will happen? So now the question is, can we close locality loophole? Yes, we can close locality loophole. So efficiency wise, no problem. We can make it 100%. But then the question is, okay, can we make it close the local, locality loophole? Yes, that is also individually problem. But more challenging problem is, can we close the all loophole together? Recent experiment, there are in 2015, there are eight different group perform eight different experiment. All are published in all well, well established journal, either PRL, science nature all say that yes they are in agreement their experiment is showing billion on inequality violation closing all the loophole together uh, sir can i ask an additional question sure sure uh, see um, as per the bell's theorem uh, yes. if hidden variables are there then the uh, permissible success uh, probability uh, is uh, correlation is uh, 75 percent as you show as you are shown in your game right just pardon me can you repeat your question you have shown a game in this talk now so in some yes, game. 75 percent is the uh, permissible possibility for yes. hidden variables if there yes. are hidden variables and the bob and alice is uh, um, okay they can have a strategy they can win uh, 75 percent you uh, Yes, in, 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 in local causal model, the success quality is 75%, uh -huh. but quantum mechanics, we can go up to 85%. Then why 85%? I am asking why 85%? And we can, that is a mathematical artifact. Uh -huh. We can come up with a new game. In my talk, I haven't included that game. In that game, actually, we can make the quantum mechanics success percentage 100%. Now, if you say why 85%, that is again a very good question. And this question is first raised by Popescu and Rollick in 80, 80, uh, 1984 foundation of physics paper. And after that paper, people have come up with new principle that, okay, relativistic causality is the, not the only principle that we require to explain this in our nature. We require more principle. One is information causality. One is communication complexity principle, non-trivial communication complexity, then local orthogonality, and then uh, then exclusivity principle and people still at present also people working in quantum foundation try to come up with new principle why in this particular game non-locality quantum so first of all is quantum mechanics is non-local nature is non-local if it is non-local why it is not full non-local why is non-locality is limited that is another next level further and people are trying to some partially we understand why it is limited non-locality, but still full understanding is not known. It is an open area of research. Thanks. Thanks to all the audience due to the time limit. I'm restricting the questions. 
and uh, uh, so let me let us thank manik for such a beautiful uh, talk uh, thank you manik thanks for uh, giving a, a very nice talk uh, as usual <laughs> thank you manik thank you thank thanks you. everyone yeah i'm uh, going to end the meeting uh, yeah thank you thank you okay bye everyone yeah. bye